Welcome to part two of the research convening. Um, I hope this is going to be an interesting time for us. Um, this is going to be um, a new part of the convening, uh, a conversation about a global health research um, ethical issue. And I'm Michelle Berry, and I'm going to have a conversation with Ann Weber. Um, Ann holds an MPH and a PhD in epidemiology from Berkeley um, and works currently with Gary Darmstadt on child development. Um, a few years ago, Ann Weber and Ann Fernald from Stanford and Yatma Diop from Michigan State University conducted a study of the effectiveness of a two-year parenting program in rural Senegal. The title of this paper, which just came out um, this year, is When Cultural Norms Discourage Talking to Babies, Effectiveness of a Parenting Program in Rural Senegal. This prompted, this paper actually prompted an 11-author commentary from nine countries accusing the authors of a neo-colonial approach to child rearing and child development. Um, and I'm gonna read you one paragraph, which I, I think was one of the most scathing critiques. And, I, and I've asked Anne to actually share her work and actually give the rebuttal uh, to this critique. So, Weber et al. 2017 appeared to be unaware of the ethnocentricity of, of the NGOs and their own notion that adults talking more with children is necessarily universally good. Their assumption about talk leading to success in life is taken out of context, plucked from their own middle class American cultural approach to child rearing. In addition, they seem unfamiliar with the cultural system of child rearing they propose to change. They do not appear to take account of the benefits of this model of child rearing, for example, that children brought up in this way are likely to have an array of communicative and learning abilities consistent with their environment. They will be able to better delay their gratification and develop, develop closer relationships with family and extended kin. In short, there is little self-reflection on the part of Weber et al. evaluation process about either their own assumptions about child rearing or what might be the approach to it by these Wolof-speaking communities. Whoa. <laughs> so I have asked Anne, actually um, the, the journal Child Development has asked Anne to actually and her co-authors to respond to this and she's written a beautiful piece. So I've asked her to start this conversation by actually describing the work she's done and then we'll get into a further conversation. Anne. Thanks, Michelle. Well, that was humbling to hear. <laughs> from, as stage brings back a lot of emotions all over again. Um, but thank you, Steve, for inviting me to talk about this. Um, I can imagine many of you can uh, imagine how I feel or I felt when I got that commentary. But so I will be presenting first pretty much the presentation I've given in other places because a lot of people are interested in this kind of work. So I'll be talking about basically what the motivation was for the study and uh, how we did the study and some of the results and then we'll get into the conversation. So um, let's see. So actually this study took place in Senegal, and just last week, there was a summit in Dakar, the capital of Senegal, uh, westernmost point on the continent, um, to basically raise funds for education. Because although with the MDGs, a lot more, they say, you know, there's a lot more bums in the seats at school, so many more kids going to primary school and secondary school education, they estimate that about half of them are still failing to learn in school. And in fact, in Senegal, there was a study of third graders um, that found that only one in 10 could read. And in fact, that statistic holds for most of Sub-Saharan Africa. 
So it's a serious problem that clearly has, um, is related to failures of the education system, thus the summit to raise money, but it also indicates that children are unprepared for school. So kids are showing up their first day of school, never even had in Senegal, not having spoken the language in which they're gonna be instructed in. Maybe they've never uh, been read to um, from a book or even seen a book or had a book in their home. So it also goes back to what's happening before they get into school. So, in addition to this information on literacy and failure of children to be able to read in schools, there's studies, um, and one was this was commissioned by Tostan, uh, the NGO I'll be talking about, in Africa, and in Senegal in particular, but common in Africa, that show that caregivers really don't talk very much to their infants. And the respondents in this study, it was pretty much a qualitative study, said, gave many reasons. Some of them are fears of social stigma, they think that people are gonna think they're crazy when they talk to a baby because there's nobody there, at least not until they start to talk back. Uh, there's some traditional beliefs around fear of looking at babies in their eyes. Uh, maybe the baby spirit will be stolen. Um, and a lot of respondents just not even understanding when learning begins in, in infants and in babies, as well as the cultural norm of, um, you know, children should uh, be seen and not heard, which was not, you know, as a norm not so long ago here in the US. So um, the link between this talk to children and later school outcomes has been studied extensively in the West, and longitudinal studies in the US have shown that children who hear more rich talk when they're infants, when they're babies, they develop better processing skills, learn new vocabulary more quickly, and long-term studies show that they do better not only in reading, uh, but also even in math um, in school. So Tostan was aware of, one, both uh, the statistics around literacy. They were aware of um, the research from the West, um, of the fact that families weren't talking to their kids. And this is an, an NGO, Tostan, that's been working in these African communities uh, for nearly 30 years, really embedded in the communities. And they knew that what parents wanted for their kids was to be successful in school. And, but that wasn't happening, so they thought, how can we help? And they weren't gonna fix the school system. They worked with communities and parents, and they thought we could work with the parents. So we'll develop a parenting program um, in the community, consisting of uh, 43 group sessions over a nine to 10 month period delivered by a facilitator who lived in the village. The village actually paid for the facilitator to be there. Um, it extended and built upon a three-year community empowerment program that they had with the parents where, where um, adults would learn some basic literacy, covered topics from starting from zero to six, of which one part was, in the early periods, focusing on more talk to children, providing families with the books in the local languages, uh, children's books that they didn't have, so they actually developed entirely new, 15 new children's books and shared those with every family. And they also had this uh, organized diffusion that they call, where they want the message to get out. If it's a cultural norm or a social norm, it's important for people in your community and your surrounding communities to know about the practice so that you're not stigmatized around it. So really embedded in the, in the community. But the ultimate aim that, yes, you get these parents engaged early in learning and you get them engaged in their schools, maybe kids will actually do better in school. So Tostan got I mean, Stanford got involved because Ann Fernald uh, was asked to evaluate the program. And I got involved because she's like, I've been working in a lab in Stanford, a little bit in Mexico, I know nothing about Africa, help. Um, so the, but the aim of the evaluation was basically to say, okay, well, if, did the Tostan program work? Did it actually change uh, caregiver behavior? And as a consequence, did children's uh, language processing or their skills improve? And as well, Anne, as a researcher, was very interested in knowing, could we extend the findings of the West to uh, Senegalese villages? So the study we performed was before and after the program. Actually, it was a one-year program at the time. They've done some sustainability extension to a two-year program now. It was in 12 program and 12 comparison villages. Because of the complexity of, of adapting language measures to an entirely new language, I mean, these are laboratory quality measures to an entirely new language and context, we, we restricted it to one language, Wolof, um, and one region in Kaolak where the culture was similar. Uh, the villages that were chosen had all taken the community empowerment program, so whether they were um, in the new parenting program or a comparison. And we recruited 
over nearly 500 caregiver child pairs in these 24 villages where children were all four to 30 months of age. So the language measures that we used, we had multiple. Um, the ones I'm going to talk about today is one was a, a naturalistic play session. So this is one that they do in the Stanford lab down the, cor down the street here, um, where you set up a play session. Mother and child are asked to sit on a mat, given everyone in the participant gets the same kind of set of toys, asked to do as they would at home, left for 15 minutes. Then later we take the, the um, recording, transcribe the middle five minutes, and count the number of words that the mom says and the child says. In addition, we have parent report measures of child vocabulary. So how many words does the mom, out of a list, does a mom report that her child knows and can say? And also language milestones. And we also confirm that validity in terms of, give me an example of, of where your child says encyclopedia. You know, tell me an example if we think they might be over-inflating their numbers. And then finally, importantly, we used a device called the Lena recording, uh, Lena. It's a recorder device that goes in a t-shirt like the one you see here, and the child wears it all day. And it gives us a measure of what's a day in the life of a child, like what is their language environment. It picks up the language around them in about a six-foot bubble around them, and then we later can extract some of the measures, automated measures from this, not about who's talking, but it gives us automated counts of words. And in particular, we look at, um, in this study, we looked at the conversational turns. So the child says something, and five seconds later, the mom responds, or an adult responds. We don't actually know it's the mom. Or an adult says something, and five seconds later, the child responds. So we know it's a child. We don't know who they're talking to. We know it's an adult, and we can count conversation, or it counts conversational turns. So here's uh, some baseline data. Um, that just basically shows that we didn't have a randomized control trial. Uh, Tostan uh, had already pre-selected the villages, so we couldn't do that. But we felt really confident that at baseline, what you see here, this is from the five-minute observation, uh, the transcription in that um, naturalistic observation of number of words, so the distribution of number of words that the mom says to the child. So child-directed speech, so it's from the caregiver to the mom. And the, um, the blue is the program villages, and the red is the control. And you can see they're very well aligned. The mean's almost identical. Um, what we see is uh, a year later in the comparison group, virtually no change. So an entire year has gone by, and really the, the control villages have said have not changed in terms of that five-minute play session. And here was the shift that uh, we saw in the program villages. So clearly, and you can watch the videos as well as the count of transcriptions, there's just a huge change in what the moms are able to demonstrate with their kids. And you might think, well, wait, you know, that's just a video camera. The mom's performing for the, for the camera. She knows what you're looking for. But I don't think that's true of the child. We wouldn't necessarily see that in the child. So these are the baseline data of what the child said. Now, some of these kids are as young as four months, so it's really skewed to the low end. And pretty good overlap. The, um, Treatment uh, villages were a little bit older, so a little bit of a shift. And all the children aged a year, so they all talk more. But there's a much larger increase in the amount of the child speech in the program villages. So this is something that we don't think is showing you know, something for the camera, right? So in response to the mom talking more. We also saw a small but statistically significant improvement in the parent report measures of vocabulary and language milestones around the order of 0.3 standard deviations, which, as Steve knows, is a pretty common kind of effect size we hope to see. Um, but here was the bad news. There was no change in the number of conversational turns with the child in either village. So there was a slight difference at baseline. So remember, the, the red is the control and the blue is the program. So a slight difference between the two sets of villages, but really no change a year later. So the child's language environment during their entire day, the nine, nine to 10 hours of their day, hadn't changed. So big change in one-on-one -on -one interaction in the play session. You think maybe it's in conflict with the other results, but we don't think so. We think there could be a number of reasons why these two data give us different results. So in the one-on-one, -on -one, clearly the mother learned new ways to engage with her child, and the child responded, and there was a lot more verbal engagement. Um, in the one on the all day language, there were a lot of considerations that we need to take into account. I mean, first of all, we had time use measures of the moms. Almost no mom reported that all she ever did during any part of her day was only take care of her child. So she's multitasking throughout the day. So there's barriers. I'm sure as any mom here in the room knows if you're trying to do dishes or laundry and everything, you know, when do you talk to your child? So there's barriers that perhaps Tostan's not addressing. 
Um, in a village, there's multiple caregivers for the child. We also had that reported of the number of different caregivers that children have. And perhaps the time that the caregiver who was trained spent with the child was only a fraction of the total time spent uh, with other caregivers in the village, so we just didn't pick up their change. And then there's still the stigma issue. Perhaps the message hadn't been disseminated more widely, and that was definitely where Tostan was going after this evaluation was to educate the imams in the villages. The imams would visit with the fathers under the tree, talk to them about the program. Expert mothers would go to other households to, to train other mothers. So they've been implementing these other sort of dissemination and sustainability models for the program. So hasn't been reevaluated since. And, um, and back to the school, it'll be a long-term uh, follow-up. Somebody wants to fund us to, uh, to go back and see the impact on schools. But Jared, Jeff, thank you. So th thank you, Anne, for describing the program. Um, if you could spend a, a few minutes now talking about, I mean, the, the program was beautifully presented and then described as a neo-colonial um, <laughs> way of child rearing, that you were introducing Western values, um, that these children could be taught other nonverbal ways of literacy. Um, why did you have a right to sort of <laughs> impose a Western style? Well, first let me just reiterate to you that getting that commentary was really harsh and um, hard to, to read. but it does give you an opportunity to reflect on that and think about, is it neo-colonialist? And I think um, I'm doing some reading, and uh, one of my colleagues, Ben Shislagi, is in the room, has written about how it underlying that is this assumption that um, cultures don't change, that they're fixed, and that, and that they, only, they don't cross boundaries. But they do. I mean, uh, we've imported African massage into the US, so um, why would we not transfer our knowledge back to them. So I think it's that it's fixed and then it's not changing. But in fact, um, this last picture, our staff, uh, Yat Majop actually, grew up in a village in uh, Kaolak. Uh, he lived with his grandmother in a village. And so he knows this culture and it's changing. The culture's changing, historical trends, even in the US, show that cultures are changing. And to say that a child's future in those village is what his father's past was. It just doesn't hold. I don't believe it holds. And so if you presume, and the parents were also saying they want their kids to, to succeed in school. So if you say that I want my child to succeed in school, if you set that as what the community says they want, and we know that talk to children, rich talk to children, improves their brain processing. The process, Anne's work shows faster processing speed in the brain before they begin to talk. Um, and even in the US today, you know, pediatricians now are encouraged to have low-income families read to their children given books. Why would we not share that information? Um, not imposing it, you know, but sharing it um, as this has been found in the West to really make a difference in terms of kids' school, and you say this is what you want, so think about whether you want to adopt this practice. So one of the um, things we all struggle about is this concept of parachuting into another culture um, and, and parachuting in with our traditional beliefs of what, in, in your case, what traditional parenting is. I was very impressed when I talked to you a couple days ago um, about your involvement in the village. Not yours per With se, the but Tostin. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how long they've been involved and how well they were inculcated into the village? Because I, I think that's something your critique didn't pick up on, your, the right. criticism paper. So can you share that? Right, I mean, it's interesting. The critique was targeted to our paper, but the program was run by Tostin. And many of you may be in that kind of situation. And I think when I, when I tend to get a little angry at the critique, it's when they criticize Tostan, because this is a, probably one of the best NGOs I've ever been aware of and definitely worked with in terms of their, they've been in the, it was started by Molly Melching. Uh, she was a Peace Corps volunteer in Senegal and she never left and she's been there for over 30 years. Her staff is 99% uh, African. The, they've been working in these communities 
If you go to a Tostan community, they love Tostan because they really teach them about, you know, what are your, what are your human rights? It starts from a human rights space of, and respect for their culture and says, what do you value in your culture? Um, and then here, let me present you with some information that we know. Do you want to accept this or not? They also um, always start with going in, and we did too, actually, as evaluators. We went in first to talk to the village chief. You never just go recruit moms. You, you go to the village chief and you explain the reason you're there. And you say, you know, do you accept us to continue this work? And they can say no. And in fact, we did have to replace some villages in our evaluation um, that said. Yeah, I, could you share? I was, that was going to be my next follow up question. Can you share why a few, I think there was at least one, mm -hmm. refused to go into the program? What were their reasons? So, into the pro, so I don't know about the program because we were given Not a list of. Into the experiment. Into our experiment. I think it's that they're fairly conservative. So, so not only does the village chief have to agree to it, but a, a woman, and this is the tradition, you have to respect this, that the woman has to get a permission from her husband. And so our experience, my personal experience was more with the husbands, didn't want their wives uh, participating in the program. And it specifically was mostly in the um, control groups, the comparison groups, because they weren't getting anything out of it, even though Tostan had agreed that they would get the parenting program after our evaluation. But they're like, why, why should I do this? I don't know what I'm getting out of it. Um, so we didn't use any kind of financial incentives for participation. We gave moms a Polaroid picture of them and their child. Um, so they're like, why should we do this? Um, so can you share some examples of times when you have seen other people parachute in and put their values on a experiment or on a tradition? Yeah, that's a, I don't know that I have personal experience. I've heard anecdotes. I think, I suspect that Steve could probably <laughs> give many examples of water and sanitation uh, projects that fail you know, that, where they, you go in with your bright idea and you haven't taken into consideration that you're putting that in a neighbor's yard and the wife can't go next door, you're, you know, or it's going to be stigmatizing in some way. But the ones that um, I've actually been talking to people since getting this critique about, what about interventions where they accepted it? So there's the ones where they just don't accept it and it's all over. And then what about the ones where they accepted it but you actually did harm? And I think that's a little harder. And the examples I've been given on those are mostly around um, gender-based violence. Again, you know, you've encouraged a woman to participate in an HIV reduction program. I have a friend who works on dreams, and, and then a woman drops out because her, hus her partner is beating her. Or I think maybe some of you have heard Gary talk about the story about soybeans and um, to improve child nutrition and economic empowerment of the women, but as a result, the, the husband takes the money, none of the, the soy goes into the child's food, so no improvement in malnutrition. The harder one for me was coming up with one where it felt like it sort of broke apart the fabric of the culture, which I think is at the heart of their critique when I read it, and a lot harder to respond to, because how do you know about those long-term consequences of a cultural practice? Um, and the example came from a friend of, of Ben Shislagi's of, you know, in southern India, where they, an NGO had been working for a while, and they had um, seen that they wanted to address issues of infant mortality, child mortality. There was no good health care system, so they built a hospital and um, started caring for the villagers. And um, mortality rates dropped. It was great, but 20 years later, they couldn't sustain it financially. Um, and they wanted to bring back some of their traditional medicines, um, their traditional practices, more herbal Ayurvedic medicine to the community. But what had happened in the meantime is that it hadn't been transferred to the younger generation. And they didn't actually have the people in the villages to do that medicine. Everybody wanted the quick fix. They became dependent on the Western model. And they just wanted to get that right away. They didn't want to have to do these other things. And so it's been this process now of trying to bring in experts from other parts of India to retrain on these cultural values. So while I have a few other questions, but I would like people in the audience to sort of think about some examples that you've had 
um, where you've had difficulty with the ethics uh, of doing your research, where it, it becomes a culture war. This really became a culture it is war, a culture war. In, a, in, a, in a way, right? I mean, I, I can tell you, and please come up to the microphones if you have a comment or a question now. But I, I can just tell you that I got involved in writing about ethics um, of doing research overseas by being in the field. And I think many of us do. I mean, mine was very many years ago at the time when HIV was just being, um, when, when we were just able to test for HIV. And I was doing a study in Tanzania. And um, the officials in Tanzania said, no, I could not. They just wanted a survey, and I could not give the information back to the, um, the person I was drawing their blood. So it was a question of how comfortable I was with not having truth telling, even though I knew it was really important for the country to know their prevalence. Um, and I've also gotten involved in um, a huge New England Journal battle with Marsha Angel when she was the editor about the difference between um, ethical imperialism that you come in with your ethics, that, and, and that has to do with an NIH you know, form where you have to sign your initial, you have to go to the mother, not to the elders, because they won't accept the elders. Um, what, what does that mean to have Western research um, put forth? Um, is that cultural, um, are you really a cultural relativist when you scream, which is what I scream, that you have to make it relevant to your setting? You don't necessarily have to give up universal standards, but you have to be respectful of the culture. So we got into this whole battle of cultural relativism um, versus ethical imperialism. Sherry. So it's a very interesting discussion. I have had an, and continue to have a problem with an experience where we ran a study in collaboration with a local partner and really investigating something our local partner wanted to know, which was why were people not accepting care? And it's a consortium of uh, religious hospitals. And when the paper came out, I guess the religious consortium, who also is the IRB, was really unhappy with it because they didn't, when, it, when cost, needless to say, was an, a reason why people weren't getting care, they were upset that it made their hospital look bad that patients couldn't afford care. Mm -hmm to the point now where getting, um, getting something through the IRB in this group has become very difficult um, because they, nothing can make the system look bad. Even though I, I didn't perceive it as we made their system look bad, they, they perceived it as looking bad. Interesting. How did you resolve it? Um, so, with my local partners, we cannot do certain studies there. Mm. So they basically, my partner there is like, no, nope, it's not going to go through. So it's, even though they're very interested in these questions, they're just, no. So had to find another site. I think you know, stigmatization is, is a big issue with, with us coming in, not understanding the culture and the, and the potential stigmas around. I mean, I think it's at a slightly different level. It's more at an institutional level than at an individual level but, that you're talking about, but still a the stigma system, around treatment system, yeah. and, and receiving HIV care or receiving you know, the implants, as Gary was suggesting to me before, you know, that those those can have serious consequences beyond like our science and what, what we'd hope I mean, to this is, in a, this is in a country where all surgical care you have to pay cash for. Right. So it's in a system where that's what's understood, but they still, it, it, it was really interesting. It's been limiting. Other stories to share? Please come up. While you're coming up, um, Anne, you, you're writing a rebuttal, and you're saying Africa is not a museum. Right. Do you want to uh, explore a little bit about what you mean by Africa is not a museum? Yeah, I, it's a wonderful quote from, um, that Molly has given us from uh, a Tostan participant, that, that Africa is not a museum, is, marching, is walking forward, and we need to walk, walk with it. And I think it gets back to the comment I made earlier about culture's not being fixed, they're changing. And if the way forward is education, 
then it's okay to move with it. If it's the way forward is cell phones to get easy cash because you don't have a financial system, then, then they need to go with it. I think that to say, you know, we want that picture of the African village and the huts and everything to stay just as they are with the woman in the field. You know, it's just, that's our vision of this, you know, museum piece. That's not their lives. Their lives are moving. They're in a global world with climate change. And, and I personally think that the solutions are going to come from them and that the tools to bring about the solutions, the fundamental is education. You know, I, 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 I think there's going to be a mix of both tradition and those tools. I mean, my favorite picture is of the Maasai with the cell phone, you know, with the, uh, the big sphere. Um, so I, I, hope, I, I hope there's a mix, that we don't lose these traditions. And, and the, uh, the great thing about Tostan is, is that so they included song and dance and encouraged um, recital of traditional poems and traditional storytelling. They have a class on massage. They really want them to bring back anything, that, anything traditional that could be helpful towards this cause as well, so that it is really a mix as opposed to, uh, I'm going to put my, my parenting practices in here and take yours away. It's not a zero-sum game like that. It's like, no, these things can work together really, really well. And we were joking earlier about, you know, maybe Tostan should come and give a class in the US about social interaction. Yes. I can't see who it is, the lights. Uh, Jess Gremby. Um, this is a really exciting and interesting conversation for me, uh, specifically because um, I, think, I think a lot about uh, the social implications of just physically us being in places where we are obviously, for, for example, Africa. You can look at me and you can see when I'm in Kenya that I am not from there. Um, and one small example, um, I, when I was working there, I was there for a year and I bought a motorcycle because that was the easiest way for me to get around between my field sites and uh, the look of especially little girls when they saw someone drive by in a motorcycle and then they realized first it was a Mzungu and then second it was a woman, like little girls' jaws hitting the ground. And just what are the, the implications of us being there and living our lives maybe more independently than women live there? And so I think thinking along just kind of this idea of cultural norms and that there's a lot of really specific norms around gender roles that just our physical presence in some of these environments is and, and we can talk about it in terms of cultures are developing and it's not a stagnant thing but I feel like a lot of pushback is specifically with respect to gender roles and, and those norms and just how how we think about and contextualize specifically since we're a group that is you know doing global global work and, and how we think about those and is it like what is the you know ethical? <laughs> should we not be? Should we be more like Tostan and have only the faces in the field be uh, locals? And how do we? Yeah. So, thank so you. the so-called Hawthorne Hawthorne effect that just by being there we've sort of impact or changed the culture. Uh, Sarah. Hi, thanks for the conversation. I have a comment, uh, and it's only peripherally related. It's less about ethics and more about the cultural imperialism theme. Um, so I wanted to share a story about a project that I have been working on for many years. I worked with the team at Harvard trying to implement surgical safety checklists worldwide. And one of the places where we went uh, to implement was in Peru. And we very we encourage people to you know, adapt it in ways that make it work within their own institution. And we found uh, in the a particular facility, it was a particular surgeon who was um, refusing to use the checklist, and we always inquire into that in order to understand why. And he told us that uh, it was embarrassing to him to use the checklist as it was recommended because we, uh, it, um, it required him to refer to people by name and it was something that he very often didn't know how to do. Uh, and the machismo kind of culture um, in South America led him to not say so and not want to use the checklist as a result. And we realized that there was an opportunity there because that was probably pretty much the way a lot of people were feeling all over the world. So we adopted kind of that mindset and, and that aspect of culture and we, we built in the solution 
to our recommendations worldwide, which was to create a kind of a large poster size checklist that they could put on the wall and, and scribble on it to, so that everybody could see the names. Um, but my point is that um, uh, kind of a response to the cultural imp imperialism objection is um, the recognition that there are opportunities for reverse innovation. Um, that that mm -hmm. we can, we, there's an awful we lot learn. to learn right, right. Um, from places where conditions are, are stressed or cultures are just simply different um, that we can import and, and use. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. So my name is Ben. <laughs> so I'd like to apologize with all the um, American people in the room because I'm Italian and we probably destroyed your food culture, bringing pizza and pasta. <laughs> um, and that's a perfect example of how culture uh, it's, it's the result of creolization, and, uh, uh, and gunpowder is another example. That it wasn't created in the West. Marxism, Christianity, right? There's plenty of examples. But I just want to share this study that we did in 2014 in West Africa, in Senegal. It was a study on fistula. Um, and I guess you all know what fistula is, and obviously since there is no C-section available for many women living in rural African villages, it's quite a problem. So the government of Senegal had made um, the surgery to repair uh, fistulas free to all the women who would, would go and seek treatment, and no, no women was. So there were no women uh, seeking treatment. And it wasn't a problem of access because these doctors were traveling around. It wasn't a problem of a, um, knowledge because these women knew exactly what fistula was and how to get treatment. So we did a massive qualitative study a, uh, almost 100 villages um, and almost 1,000 respondents. And what we find out is that uh, these women were hiding fistula from their husbands and everyone else in the community. Because if you have fistula in the villages we did our research, you are impure. And so you can't touch the children, you can't touch the food, You're, all the other women will laugh uh, at you and you will be isolated. So, so what is the solution? So that's the culture, so we need to withdraw. And so this is an example to say that the extreme cultural relativism, I think, leads to inaction. So you're a different culture, so I can't talk to you, because in my expressing my ideas, you might change your mind, or vice versa. And I think the dichotomy is the problem, right? So the fact that it's either universal or relative, but there is a, it's a spectrum, there is a lot of stuff that can be done in the middle. And I think that this study is a great example of uh, how culture can be enculturated, and there's a beautiful paper that Gary worked on, uh, which is about enculturating science rather than imposing it. So just to say, it's not a dichotomy. Either we destroy culture or we do nothing. Yeah, I think your, uh, your story also opens up a, a real Pandora's box of what stigma is in different cultures, because so many different cultures have a different approach to what stigma, what, what is stigmatized as a person, and fistula is particularly stigmatizing in parts of sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. I think we only have time for one more, if you can make it quick. I think we're 140, right? Yeah, 139, so. Yeah, I'll make, ah. it, I'll make it quick. Um, so uh, my name is Mohan, and uh, I've been uh, grappling with uh, an ethical dilemma, and I'm still trying to figure out how I play into this. Um, so I'm a first-generation American, and my parents immigrated from uh, India. And more recently, I've had the opportunity to be involved with uh, um, sustained health initiatives from the same area that uh, they're from. And uh, given that I know the language and have a general sense of cultural competency and all of that, uh, my motivation to be involved was to be able to give back to a community that's given me so much. But I find that whenever I'm out there, a sense of guilt kind of overwhelms me because of how I uh, identify with being an American and having my heritage still be there and uh, being that I look the part and can function within that community, that struggle has been internalized and it's, it's, uh, it's still something that I, I'm not entirely sure how to cope with as an individual, but something that I would really like to learn how to you know, kind of control and make more functional. Um, go overseas and get in the field and give back. <laughs> and I hope you make a connection here in this room um, to be able to do that and sort of um, palliate some of those feelings that you have. But we encourage you to do that. There are many opportunities for you to do that. 
Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, Steve, next. Thank Anne. Thank you. Anne. Thank Anne very much. <laughs> so, no, 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 no. I, 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 this is a very painful uh, <laughs> thing. So I, I, I give her another hand, please. Thank you. But I think it brought up many important questions and answers, Anne. Yeah, um, I also want to salute Anne's courage in yeah. terms of bringing these kind of painful criticism forward. Um, because I think those of us who have experienced in global health sometimes recognize that it's pretty public and this criticism can be pretty harsh and stinging. If you don't want any criticism or any feelings of guilt, you just don't go to the field and ignore it. But if you're gonna engage in the world, this is gonna happen. And I really um, salute Anne's willingness um, to bring this to us and have us think and talk about it. 